Um, hello everyone, welcome to this uh, uh, video on um, risk and reward in um, uh, supply chains. We'll mostly be, we'll mostly be looking at uh, the inventory issues and how sharing risk and reward can happen through uh, some uh, interesting inventory management. So this is part of chapter 15 in the textbook. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's covered in chapter 15. We will only be doing the sharing risk and reward in the supply chain portion, chapter 15, so 15.1, uh, 2, 3, and 4. We are not going to cover any of that. We are just going to cover 15.5. So everything that I do um, in in these series of videos, I'm planning on doing about uh, four videos, uh, short four short videos. That, that is all that, uh, that's part of the syllabus for this uh, this particular uh, from this particular chapter right so sharing uh, risk and rewards in supply chain so the main idea behind what we are going what we are going to learn about in this uh, in this chapter is that uh, one of the one of the things going for a supply chain understanding that you're part of a supply chain and understanding the um, issues that your suppliers and your customers have to deal with and maybe sharing some of this issue and sharing some some of the information what it can do is it can increase the profits for everybody in the supply chain right so uh what we'll do is we look at a few models we look at a few examples that tell us why it is important and so let's begin with a very very basic example uh which is the impact of local optimization so just working locally is not good Working locally does not always lead to uh, the best uh, uh, best scenario. So independent actions by two parties. So let's look at a simple supply chain. There is a manufacturer who's selling to a retailer. Let's look at the simple example. Then the in and independent actions by these two entities, the manufacturer and the retailer, if they make decisions by themselves, what that does is the overall profit for the supply chain is lower and profit for each of the entities is also going to be lower. Usually what happens is stronger firms tend to push risk onto supply chain partners and that way they're able to share some of the burdens uh, of running the supply chain, right? So look, let's just get a simple, uh, let's get a simple example. So consider a mu music store that sells compact. So they don't, so this is, uh, you could say this is a dated example, but also think of this as special stores that that sell novelty compact discs. Nobody buys CDs anymore, right? But people uh, who still have nostalgia for when they when they listen to CDs in their youth may have some. Uh, uh, there, there might be some um, uh, novelty factor to that, and you might be able to sell some CDs there. So let's say that the manufacturer manufactures the uh, the uh, um, compact discs, the CDs for um just give me a second it says the manufacturer manufactures this for uh, one dollar a unit and sells it to the music store for five dollars per unit and then the retailer sells each disc to the end customer at ten to at ten dollars per unit now at this retail price the market demand is normally distributed of with a mean of 1000 and a standard deviation of 300. Now, any leftover discs at the end of the sale are essentially worthless because, like I said, nobody buys CDs anymore. So the question is, how many discs should the independent retailer order and what are the supply chain profits for the independent retailer? So let's talk about that first and then we'll see what happens when they are, uh, uh, when when things are uh, integrated, right? So let's look at the first scenario. In this first scenario, you have these two separate companies. The first company is making the compact disc and selling it to the, uh, uh, to the retailer and the retailer then sells it to the customer. So this is, uh, if you look at the, problem for the retailer, the retailer sees a demand that is normally distributed with a mean of 1000 standard deviation of 500. They have to buy from a supplier, they have to buy the disc for $5 and then sell it for $10 and they cannot salvage any of the discs at the end because any discs that are not useful are just thrown out. So, there's a, so that's essentially a news vendor problem because they have a single selling season which is to the sale. If they're not selling by the sale, they have to throw it out. And then of course, as far as the manufacturer of the series is concerned uh, based upon what the uh, retailer orders from them they are selling so many series so everything is clear on their end so let's look at how this is done so i'm going to open up the uh, open up a new file so i'm going to open up a 
brand new file here but i'm going to copy some of the formulas that we wrote last time like i said there's absolutely no reason why uh, i should be rewriting these formulas again and again so i'm going to go online there you go the seasonal inventory management formulas so i'm just going to copy this formula out <laughs> same formulas that we have here i am going to copy here there you go okay so uh, bigger right so uh, I'm gonna say retailer here actually let me not say that here so we know that the demand is 1000 we know that the standard deviation is 500 we know that the retailer is going to buy each disk for five dollars and sell it for ten dollars right buy it for five dollars they're going to sell it for ten dollars and as far as the salvage is concerned there is no salvage value you cannot salvage these uh discs at all so zero dollars no salvage value at all so what this does is it makes the cost of understocking five dollars because if you're understocked by one compact disc you've lost a profit of five dollars if you're overstocked by one uh, if you're overstocked if you have one extra compact disc it means that you've spent five dollars buying the compact disc now you have to just throw it out so that is a loss of five dollars so the cost of understocking and the cost of overstocking are absolutely they're equal to each other and so what that does to the critical ratio is it is c over c plus u so that becomes fifty dollars fifty percent so everything is equal so if the critical ratio is 50 percent then your optimal order quantity is exactly equal to the average value so again the formulas are all there so exactly equal to the average value so you're going to order 1000 cds so the retailer is going to order 1000 cds from the manufacturer and can expect a profit of 4801 dollars now the expected understock is 20 20 compact discs and the expected overstock is also 20 oh oops i think i made a mistake i think this should be 500 that makes a lot more sense right it's, it is 500 yeah? uh, 1000 and standard deviation of 300 i'm sorry that's my i don't know why i got 50 in the first place right so the critical ratio doesn't change so this only influences your expected profit and uh, obviously the understock and the overstock values now this is how much profit expected profit for retailer right now let's calculate the expected profit for a uh, manufacturer right so if i calculate the expected uh, profit for the manufacturer the manufacturer is going to make uh, uh, they're they going to make the they are making the distance one dollar and they're selling it to the retailer at five dollars right so they are making a profit of four dollars <laughs> I'm sorry four dollars for each of the uh, for each of the discs because they are sell they are making it for five one dollar and selling it for five dollars as far as the manufacturer is concerned and they are doing that uh, with the same with the same number as the order quantity so this is how many units the retailer is going to order from the manufacturer if the manufacturer is selling 1000 units to the retailer that is how many units they are going to make a profit on and so the profit for the manufacturer is 4000 profit for the retailer is 3803 so the total profit of the supply chain is the sum of these two numbers which is 7803 so that's the total profit for the supply chain so 3,803, the expected profit for the retailer, and 4,000 is the expected profit for the manufacturer. The total expected profit for the supply chain is 7,803. Now, this is an example where you have a separate manufacturer and a separate retailer. Now, you have companies that are, that are vertically integrated. So vertically integrated means that there's a company that, uh, that um, manages a very large part or maybe even the whole supply chain so think of apple so if you look at um, um, a laptop that apple makes if you look at a macbook or a macbook pro or any of these computers apple makes a laptop apple doesn't make the parts within the laptop but apple makes a laptop apple makes the operating system it makes all the accessories and everything and then it man it manufactures the laptop itself now so the apple is way more vertically integrated than say a company like 
I don't know, HP, right? So HP doesn't make the operating system themselves. They don't make many of the parts themselves. They, in fact, they don't manufacture it themselves. They get, they get it manufactured by third party. So there are a lot of different things that go into it. So some companies are more vertically integrated than other companies. Some companies own the whole uh, stack. So everything from growing coffee to uh, harvesting the coffee to grinding the coffee to selling the coffee. There are companies which do the whole thing where they own the whole supply chain of coffee. So that is an example of completely vertically integrated. But most companies in the world are not 100% vertically integrated. They might be vertically integrated to a certain extent. But in this example, let's say that both the, the company that is manufacturing the compact disc is the same company that is selling the compact discs, right? So let's take that example. So let me call this not vertically integrated. I'll call this vertically integrated. So if the same company was vertically integrated, it means that I'm going to copy this out here the mean the standard mean and standard deviation are the same the the sales price is the same but the cost is no one dollar the company can manufacture it for one dollar and they're selling it for the same price one dollar which means that the cost of understocking now is much higher than the cost of overstocking there's only one there's only one dollar for the cost of overstocking because it costs you one dollar to make the um to make the CD, so that's how much you're spending on it, but it costs you $9 to, uh, you can make $9 by selling the CD. Basically. So the critical ratio is 0 0.9, and the optimal order quantity now is 1384. So the optimal number of units in the supply chain should be 1384, if this whole supply chain is completely vertically integrated, 1384. And then the expected profit, now this is not for the retailer, this is the total expected profit for the supply chain itself, because there is no separate retailer or manufacturer, is 8,474. So if this whole thing is completely vertically integrated, you have you the supply chain will make $8,474. But because it is not vertically integrated, split into two, two separate entities, the total profit for the supply chain is only 7,803. So, some sort of integration is useful but obviously let's say that they are two separate companies let's say that the manufacturer is different and the supplier is different that's the reality if that's the case can the manufacturer and the retailer do something together so that they can make more than $7,803. They will never be able to make $8,474. They will never be able to approach this com completely, but can they make say $8,000 together or can they make $8,100 together or some number higher than what they're making right now in such a way that both companies make more money. Now that's obvious. If it turns out that you can uh, optimize the supply chain and make a lot more money, but only ma the manufacturer is making money and the retailer, in fact, is not making as much money, that is not a good scenario. You have to, it has to be such that both manufacturer and retailer make more money. Is that possible? And that's that's what we'll be talking about, right? So, so 8,474, that's how much money they can potentially make. So the absence of risk, risk sharing in a supply chain results in locally optimal decisions that decrease the total supply chain profits. In the absence of risk sharing, retailers aim for a lower level of product availability, right? Okay, now let me just check something. I'll be right back. Okay, I had to, um, I had to do some uh, uh, technical stuff. I had to take a small break. Anyway, com coming back to it. Right. So, uh, what? How can you share uh, risks to grow supply chain profits? There are three main approaches that uh, re retailers and uh, uh, companies within a supply chain uh, can use to share some of the risk and grow supply chain profits. One is buyback or returns. Uh, the second is revenue sharing, and the final is quantity flexibility. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end this video here. I'm going to make a separate video for the models for buyback and buybacks and returns, a separate video for revenue sharing, and maybe a separate video for quantity flexibility, or maybe I'll mix these through into a single video. We'll, uh, you, you'll see in a second, right? So that's so that's the plan uh, for, uh, uh, for for these three uh, approaches.
Right? I'll see you on the next video.